Here we're taking a look at how zero stiffness degrees of freedom are removed so that a problem can be solved. In this case, we have an example of a one-dimensional problem, two springs in series that, let's say it takes place in two-dimensional space, how does this get solved? And so if we go ahead and take a look at that problem again, two springs in series, and we go ahead and just create our elemental stiffness matrix for element one in one dimension, which is what we might be familiar with at this point. There's our forces and displacements at each node, our stiffness. We just have one degree of freedom at each node. There's our forces, there's our displacements, and here's our stiffness matrix. Okay, now if we're gonna go ahead and do that same elemental stiffness matrix in two dimensions, we still have our axial forces, our axial displacements, our axial stiffness, but we're also going to have transverse displacements and transverse forces, and we're also gonna have rotations and moments. So in two dimensions, we have two additional degrees of freedom at each node, which means that our stiffness matrix for the element, which was two by two, is now going to be six by six because we now have three degrees of freedom at each node. Note that when we look at this right now, it still resembles our original stiffness matrix in one dimension. The only difference is, is that now we're gonna plug in a lot of zeros for the transverse and rotational stiffness. That's the only difference, just plugging in a lot of zeros. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look now at, just draw out the problem there. Let's take a look at our global matrix equation. One dimension, going back to one dimension here, we have one degree of freedom per node, and you can see how element one gets populated connecting nodes one and two, node, or pardon me, element two populates degrees of freedom two and three, or nodes two and three. If we were to solve through this problem, we would go through constraining node one, and then we would go ahead and say that our force at node three is P, force at node two is zero, and then we can go ahead and create our reduced matrix equation. There we go. And from that, we can solve for our displacements at node two and node three in the horizontal direction. Now that's if we go ahead and assume right off the bat that this whole problem takes place in one dimension, in one dimension only. Now if we go ahead and move on to looking at our global matrix equation in two dimensions, note already how we have the transverse stiffness or pardon me, transverse force and the moment now at each node. Written in gray to sort of indicate that they don't really have an effect, but they're placeholders, they exist. And when we populate this, it looks very similar to what we had for one dimension, except we have all these additional zeros for all these zero stiffness degrees of freedom. And so, if we were to go to the next step, which is trying to constrain node one. And so we go ahead and create our, our global stiffness matrix again. And we constrain node one. If we were to try to solve for our displacements at node two and node three in this form, it wouldn't work. It would still be, or pardon me, it would, it would blow up because we have all these zeros. It's still a singular matrix. And so here's my attempt to draw in a chihuahua growling. All right, takes for a while. Let's try and bring in the stiffness matrix. It seemed a lot cuter when I drew it. Anyway, so, so you can't do it. And so what happens is there's an automatic constraining of zero degree of freedom, or probably zero stiffness degrees of freedom that takes place. And this is especially pertinent when we start looking at things like uh, uh, two-dimensional elements, uh, maybe isoparametric elements, and then three-dimensional uh, tetrahedral or quadrilateral, uh, or probably hexahedral elements. This takes place all the time. And so what we do is we need to remove the zero stiffness rows and columns. And so what we're doing is we're taking a look at that, what we had in the previous slide for that reduced matrix, sort of reduced, but it was still singular. And we just take a look at where all those zeros are and then there it is. We say assume that the displacements 
R0 for the transverse displacement at node 2 and 3 and the rotation at nodes 2 and 3. And if we go ahead and do that, we can remove those rows and columns. And we're left with the same reduced matrix equation that we had if we assumed one degree of freedom at the start. If we assumed one dimension, probably one dimension at the start. Same exact equation. And from there, of course, we can go ahead and solve by inverting this matrix. Whoops. Inverting that over the other side, multiplying by the forces, solving for our displacements. Okay. So the reflection question. Let's go ahead and say that we have a truss element in two dimensions. How many zero stiffness degrees of freedom are there in its elemental stiffness matrix? And then the next question is, why do the zero stiffness rows and columns need to be removed from the global stiffness matrix equation in order to solve for the displacements? Why can't we keep them in there? And those are the only reflection questions we have, and that concludes this video. Thank you much.